This is the 12th and penultimate video in the Edexcel P3 revision tutorial series. Today we will be looking at collisions as well as the conservation of momentum. In this video we will look at both elastic and inelastic collisions in terms of momentum and kinetic energy. We will analyse collisions in one dimension and we will carry out calculations using momentum conservation for a two body collision. The most important rule to remember for momentum is that it's always conserved. This means that the total momentum after a collision must be equal to the total momentum beforehand. There are three types of collision that could come up. The first is where the particles or objects bounce off each other in a simple collision. The second where they join together after a collision. And the final one where you have an explosion or a decay event which sends particles or objects in two separate directions following a static start. So momentum is when an object has both mass and velocity. This is given by the following equation. So momentum in kilogram meters per second equals mass in kilograms times velocity in meters per second. Momentum is given the symbol P, mass M and velocity V. So if we look at a sample question. In our question, we have a 1,000 kilogram car which is travelling at 5 metres per second. What is its momentum? So from this, we already know that we are looking for the momentum. And in the question, we can see clearly we have been given the mass in kilograms and the velocity in metres per second. We will now plug these numbers into our equation. So we have our momentum P equals our mass 1000 kilograms times by our velocity 5 meters per second. So this will give us an answer of 5000 kilogram meters per second. We can then use this to look at the momentum before and after a collision. However, before we do that, we need to look at elastic and inelastic collisions. So overall, there are two types of collision. These are elastic and inelastic. In both types of collision, the momentum will be conserved. However, in an elastic collision, this is where the kinetic energy is conserved. This means that no energy is dissipated or lost as heat or sound. However, in an inelastic collision, then some of this kinetic energy will be lost as heat or sound. It will be converted into other forms of energy. In an elastic collision, this is like if one car were to collide with another car and the two objects were to stick together whilst not giving out any heat or sound. This is far more common at a subatomic level with neutrons and protons colliding. An example of an inelastic collision is a ball bouncing, whereby if you drop a ball, it will bounce, but it won't bounce as high as the height you dropped it from. This is because some of the energy has been transferred and therefore lost as heat or sound. Obviously, if the ball loses kinetic energy, it will have less gravitational potential energy, so this is not conserved. So once again, to compare our elastic and inelastic, in elastic, no kinetic energy is lost. This is the key point, that kinetic energy is conserved. Since kinetic energy is not lost, no energy can go into heat or sound, and also there is no damage caused to either colliding object. As I said, this is far more common with atomic or nuclear particles with similar charges. For an inelastic collision, this is where some of that kinetic energy will be converted into other forms of energy, usually heat and sound. And importantly, the momentum is still conserved, with the example being a bouncing ball, as it won't bounce up as high as where it was dropped from, but likewise we could look at a Newton's cradle, where each collision 
causes a passing on of energy. However, due to some of the energy being lost as heat and sound, these would all be inelastic collisions. We will now look at a momentum calculation to look at the momentum before and after a collision. As we have seen, in any collision or explosion, momentum will be conserved, provided that there are no external forces having an effect, for example, friction. A question could be as such. Two cars are racing around the M25. Car A collides with the back of car B and the cars stick together. This makes it an elastic collision. What speed do they move at after the collision? We have a lot of information here, so we're going to gradually break it down. For car 1, we are given the velocity and the mass, so we can work out our momentum. And likewise for car 2, we are given the velocity and the mass, so we can work out the momentum. Remember that the momentum is the mass times by the velocity. It is important to note that velocity is always given a plus or minus sign. This is in order to show what direction the object is travelling in. Remember that velocity needs to be a speed in a direction, not just the direction. So if we work these out, we get the following momentums. Where car 1 has a momentum of 50,000 kilogram meter per second and car 2 has a momentum of 16,000 kilogram meters per second. We have already been given the resulting mass, however to work this out we take the mass of the first object and add the mass of the second object to give us our overall mass of 1800 kilograms. We now must do the same thing with our momentums. So we're going to take the momentum of car 1 and add it to the momentum of car 2. Both of these numbers are going to be a positive number due to the positive velocity of both cars. So we must have the same momentum before and after and this will give us 50,000 plus 16,000, 66,000 kilogram meters per second. We can now work out the velocity by doing velocity equals momentum divided by mass. And this will give us a velocity of plus 36.6 recurring meters per second. It needs to be a positive value in order to ensure that the velocity has both a speed and a direction. We can also look at the kinetic energy before and after the collision. In order to do this, we need to use kinetic energy, Ke, equals half mv squared. So before the collision, we need to work out the overall kinetic energy before, which will be the kinetic energy of car 1 plus the kinetic energy of car 2 giving us the kinetic energy before the crash of 1,410,000 joules. If we now do this for the kinetic energy after the collision, giving us our half mv squared of half 1800 from our overall mass after the collision, times by our calculated velocity for after the collision. This gives us an answer of 1,205,604 joules. So we can see that we have in fact lost kinetic energy during the collision. This means that this collision is an inelastic event, which makes sense as two cars that collide together, even if they do then stick together, are likely to cause energy to be transferred into heat and sound. We can also look at momentum on an atomic level. So here we've got the nuclear decay of americium-241 to form neptunium-237 and give off this alpha particle. When an atom goes through nuclear decay, we go through a mini explosion event. 
whereby the movement of one particle being emitted will cause the nucleus, this newly formed nucleus, to move in the opposite direction. And so in this case, the neptunium atom is going to move away to the left and the alpha particle is going to move to the right. An example exam question is the following. If the new neptunium atom moves away at a speed of minus 5 times 10 to the 5 metres per second, what was the speed of the alpha particle? For these calculations, we are not given anything in kilograms. Instead, we are going to take the mass solely as the mass number. So our equivalent masses, we have neptunium with a mass of 237, americium with a mass of 241, and the alpha particle with a mass of 4. With this information, we can now calculate the momentum of both the neptunium atom as well as the americium atom. For americium, we have got a mass of 241, and we have got a velocity of zero meters per second. The americium is not moving, and as such, we have an overall momentum of zero. For our neptunium, we have got a mass of 237 and a velocity of minus five times 10 to the five meters per second. We work out our momentum exactly the same, doing our mass times by our velocity, which gives us the following. A momentum of 118 and a half million. As our momentum before the collision was zero, due to americium 241 not moving, this means that our momentum after the collision must also equal zero. Therefore, our momentum of our alpha particle must also equal are 118 and a half million. However, this time it's going to be a positive value as it will be moving towards the right. So we now have our alpha particle with a mass of four and a momentum of positive 118 and a half million. We now need to work out the velocity. So just as we did before, we're going to do our velocity equals our momentum divided by our mass. This gives us a velocity of 29,625,000 meters per second, which we can convert into standard form to give us a final answer of 2.96 times 10 to the seven meters per second. We will now look at a six mark question from an Edexcel past paper. So the question we have, different types of collision are shown in the diagrams. Analyze both collisions in terms of momentum and kinetic energy. So in collision one, we've got two objects colliding and sticking together. And then in collision two, we've got a transfer of energy. So in collision one, the two objects are moving in opposite directions before the collision and it is an inelastic collision. They are stationary after the collision, so the momentum is zero after the collision. Therefore, the total momentum must also have been zero before the collision. The cars were moving at the same speed in opposite directions, assuming the cars have equal mass. This means that both cars had kinetic energy before the collision. Kinetic energy is zero after the collision. Therefore, the kinetic energy must have been converted into heat, sound or other forms of energy. In our second collision, we now have an elastic or almost elastic collision where the momentum is conserved. However, we have also got this transfer of kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is conserved or almost conserved. This is because the last sphere here reaches the same height as the first sphere here. Three spheres in the middle always have zero momentum and a small amount of energy may be lost as sound or heat. So it is an almost fully elastic collision. 
we will now look at how momentum is conserved in positron-electron annihilation events. You should remember that an annihilation event happens when a positron and an electron meet. This is because we have a particle, in this case the electron, meeting its antiparticle, in this case a positron. When this happens, all of the mass of both particles is converted into energy, which is given off in the form of gamma rays. When they meet, they collide head-on at the same speed and moving in opposite directions. Because they have the same mass and opposite velocities, the total momentum before the collision is zero. The gamma rays that are produced need to also have a total momentum of zero. This happens because the gamma rays are produced and they have the same energy but the opposite velocities. They will move out in opposite directions to each other. The in any reaction including particles, the total charge before and after the reaction must also be equal. In this reaction, before the reaction happens, we have an electron with a charge of minus one and a positron with a charge of plus one, making an overall charge before the reaction of zero. After the reaction, we have the release of our two gamma rays. Gamma rays have no charge, so the charge after the collision is also zero, and therefore the charge is conserved. The final thing we will look at is how mass energy is conserved using an equation. In order for our mass energy to be conserved, we need to use Einstein's most famous equation. Einstein said that mass is a form of energy, and as such, we can use the equation E equals mc squared, where our E is our energy measured in joules, m is our mass measured in kilograms, and c is our speed of light which is 3 times 10 to the 8 metres per second. As we saw on the previous page, the mass energy is conserved in an annihilation reaction as all the mass of the electron and positron have been converted into energy. An example question would be as follows. So our question reads, calculate the minimum energy released when an electron and a positron annihilate. The mass of an electron or positron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilos. The first thing we need to do is calculate our total mass. We know in an annihilation we have one electron and one positron. Therefore, our total mass will be 2 times 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31, which is 1.82 times 10 to the minus 30 kilos. With our total mass, we can now calculate our energy by taking our total mass of 1.82 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms and timesing it by c squared, which is going to be our 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. So when we put this into a calculator, we will get our answer of 1.638 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. This is the minimum energy, so we are ignoring the kinetic energy of the particles before they collide. This annihilation event links nicely to the positron emission tomography we have looked at earlier on in these videos. In the next and final video in this series of P3 revision tutorials, we will look at kinetic gases, temperature, pressure and volume, as well as kinetic theory.